Hey, okay, uh, welcome uh, both online people and uh, our in-person people and online people here and uh, let's continue on. We are getting towards the end of this first semester and uh, so some of you, this will be wrap up for you. For others, it'll just be kind of a transition from the end to the beginning of a the next chapter, which is chapter 18. So uh, let's do 16 today, and I do want to point out then we've got 16, and believe it or not, just one more chapter, uh, 17, and that'll wrap it up. This is the last chapter, though, that will be on the exam three, and so I'll get that out there. Now, exam three is still, let's see, it's next Tuesday, so you still have quite a few days to digest all of this and I know that uh, you're working towards that and uh, anyways uh, this last bit of a semester always gets hectic and busy and lots of information here. So let's talk about uh, today's uh, information. Both this chapter 16 and the next one 17 are kind of our new little segment and we're going to talk about oscillation in waves and uh, in particular sound waves in chapter 17 but right now we'll just talk about waves and wave properties in general starting with some oscillations and some ah uh, oh I don't want to scare anybody but some really interesting mathematics <laughs> uh, follows al uh, along here. Uh, also I'm going to say that we're just are going to run short of covering every section so I'm going to do the oscillations of chapters one through or, or sections one through five uh, then I'm going to jump over and do the wave properties in ch sections nine ten and eleven so so keep that in mind you don't need to do the whole chapter read the whole chapter I will just you know I'll give you that information and then we'll call it a wrap for this particular chapter. So where does this uh, chapter begin? Well interesting enough he repeats Hooke's Law and I say repeat because we've already seen Hooke's Law but I thought maybe I'll take a small moment maybe go kind of quickly to repeat his step. Uh, it's why I put the springs back up here. You might remember back in chapter 7 I did something like this. I said alright what if we put a little hook on a spring and we measure where the bottom is where it extends to what I called its natural length. You might call it its unstretched length. And then we put a certain amount of weight on it. Now this happens to actually be 4.9 newtons but not worrying about how much force. Notice it stretched and then and I'll just stop here. I won't do a bunch more like I did back in chapter 7. But what you hopefully see is that every time you pull it by the same amount, which in my case is about 5 newtons, and so if x represents the distance you stretch it, and f is the amount of force from the spring, we have a nice linear relationship. And so we said the magnitude of the force is equal to kx, where that k is the spring constant. And good, you guys are shaking your head, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I remember that. Okay, good, because we're going to use a lot of springs today, because springs are a great place to have oscillations. In fact, I will just tease you a little bit of where we're headed. I have a spring hanging vertically here and so if I were to maybe lift it up a little bit and let it go you can see that it that oscillates and then and, and that's what we're going to study. We're going to study oscillations. What what causes an oscillation and I know already that you know that you probably know that if you just have a spring it shakes <laughs> back and forth. So you can see why we're talking about springs. And now I'll take this a step further and remind you that the work or the energy stored in the spring was integrating the force as you stretched it. 
And this is that chapter on conservation of energy where I said I had some good news, even though it looked real hard at the start. I said, let's do all the integrals together. <laughs> let, let me do the integrals for you. And I'm going to say the same thing in a moment. We're going to set up a, a, a pretty tough mathematical equation, but let me do it for you. <laughs> or maybe I should say with you. And that way you won't have to do it again. And so I'll just kind of repeat what we did before. Oh, and I, maybe I should say it was force times distance times cosine of the angle between them because when we did it for the spring we got this kx dx and we also said that the direction of the force is opposite of the direction you pull the spring so if you pull the spring down the force is up or if you compress the spring up the force is, is down but in either case if we went from some initial position to some final position, we had this minus kx dx and dot, 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 dot. Bottom line is, I'm just going to say, do you remember the energy in a spring, 1 half kx squared? And I think you're going to say yes. And uh, I think that was even one of the multiple choice ones on the uh, exam. It had like a spring and you had a calculate the energy or the K or, 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 or something. But it was kind of a straightforward calculation where we just said this is the elastic energy in a spring. So your author starts off with the, that and that's what he does in this graph. He says here's the force from a spring, here's the area under the graph. He even gives a nice example of a little toy gun here where the spring is compressed and again maybe not spending too much time here but at least kind of writing down the hopefully the obvious answer here is he says that if the spring is horizontal then all of the energy from the spring uh, then goes into the kinetic energy of this little plastic ball that this toy gun is, is shooting. And I want to emphasize if it is horizontal uh, because it kind of reminds me of kind of a tough problem you guys just had on the test where the spring was vertical. And so instead of just and you didn't so you and it and it stopped it. So you didn't have kinetic energy, you had potential energy on this side. And so that was kind of the difference between this problem and the test problem. And I, I shouldn't dwell too much on the on the test. All right. But uh, moving on then, your author says, okay, knowing a little bit about a spring, let's do something like this. And where's his his picture? And I'll even uh, set it up here. But it looks like uh, I wrote down here. Uh, in figure 10, he says, what happens, no, it's nine first. What happens if you just hook a mass onto a spring or next to a spring? And so here's going to be my little experiment for you. I have this little cart, if you will. You can kind of see it shakes back and forth. You might you know, question whether I have a spring because what I really have are these this metal rail here that pushes it back and, and forth. And so you might think of it the same as this picture where you have a spring connected to it and it can make it oscillate here. And so that's what I want you to think about. So I'm going to take a mass and I guess technically the cart itself already has some mass. And so whatever the cart is plus this one kilogram I put on here, if I were to pull it to the side and let it go, it shakes, it, it oscillates. How quickly does it oscillate? How many times a minute does it go back and forth? Or how many times a second does it go back and forth? Uh, what is its amplitude? I and mean, we can ask a lot of questions about this, starting with just why does it go back and forth? So here's some good news. The good news is I'm not going to really give you any new physics here today. What I am going to do is to say, let's take Hooke's Law, which we learned back in Chapter 7 and just reviewed, and put it together with Newton's Laws of Motion. Didn't we say? that the neat thing about physics is it's a few fundamental principles explain a universe of phenomenon.
And so I'm just going to take Newton's laws of motion and put it together with the force from a spring, draw my free body diagram, and see if we can figure out the motion of this. And like I said, the math is a little advanced, so let's do it together and then you won't have to work out the math. Again, you'll just get the result of the math. And so I'm going to come over here and say, all right, let's draw a free body diagram. And so I'll just take the mass, call it M, and say, okay, what forces are on this mass? And I'll start with the boring and easy ones. Let's look at the vertical ones. And so we said, again, going back to, I guess this would be chapters four, five, and six, but particularly four, we said that, hey, the forces will be gravity, that's its weight, and everything touching it. So I'm going to come over here and say, all right, what's pulling it down is mg. And what's touching it, well, that cart is touching it. So that cart is going to lift it perpendicular, I'll call it normal. But also, there'll be a force, and I'll say S, from the spring. Because the spring is being stretched or compressed or whichever way you want to talk about it. And, and that's what your author does here in this picture. He says, here is our free body diagram. And in this case, he, he's pulling the spring to the right. And then he's got the weight and the normal. And then he's got the force horizontally going to the left. But then he realizes that if it compresses all the way past the equilibrium point to here... Uh, then the force is to the right. And he does some other places, like right here, when it's back at the equilibrium, there would just be the up and down force and no horizontal force. And then when it gets back to this part, which looks a lot like this one, it, it would, again, just be a to the left force. I like to do this. I like to say that the force from the spring... And I like to put kind of a double arrowhead and just say, well, since the spring is going back and forth, <laughs> sometimes it's to the left and sometimes it's to the right. Okay. But if we keep that in mind, and again, we go back to Newton's second law and we divide our paper into horizontal and vertical motion, the vertical, like I said, is boring, but I'll do it. It says we've got a normal force going up. We've got an mg going down. That says if you add up all the forces in the y direction, so I did, you have to set it equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. Uh, in fact, maybe I should have squeezed this in first. This is the sum of all the forces in the y direction. I suppose you would even argue that it doesn't accelerate in the y direction. Like I said, the y direction is pretty boring. It just moves back and forth horizontally. That's what we want to study. And so this just comes out to say the normal force is equal to mg. So like I said, for completeness, I'll do the y, but it's kind of boring. Let's really focus our attention on the x. Okay. So the x says, let's add up all the forces in the x direction. That needs to equal mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And of course, you can now see why we kind of set it up to try to make it as easy as possible. The only force in the x direction is the spring. Purposely set up that way, because that's what we want to study. So what is the equation for the force from a spring. Well, I'm going to put up here Hooke's Law because we just said as a review that the magnitude of the force is kx. So I'm not going to change that, but I do want to point out something here in terms of direction. Here's where it gets maybe a little tricky. And so let's pretend I'm that mass on the spring. All right. So if you were to pull me this way, so positive x, which way does the spring pull? Negative. 
Okay, so see how the force from the spring is opposite of my position. Fortunately, that works the other direction too. I mean, watch this. If you pull me in the negative direction, which way is the force? In the positive direction. So I could, fortunately, not have to worry about which way is the force actually pointing, at least in terms of the mathematics. I can say the force from the spring is equal to negative kx. What does the negative mean? Well, let's interpret the negative as meaning it's the opposite of x. In other words, if x is positive, the force is negative. But if x is then negative, the force is now positive. So that's one, and maybe the easiest part of the math I want to show you, that luckily we do not have to break this problem into the two pieces that you might have thought of at first. At least I did. When I looked at the free body diagram, I'd say, oh, wow, I've got two different free body diagrams. I've got one when it's pointing to the left and one when it's pointing to the right. Do I need to do those separate? And fortunately, no. Okay, so keep that in mind that when I say what is the force from the spring, if I put here minus kx, that would be true whether the object moves to the positive or to the negative. Okay, good. And so that's the first piece of mathematics that, like I said, is maybe a little more advanced and I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Now, Here's where the math gets a little challenging. Like I said, I'd like to study this motion and ask this question. Could, could you solve this for x? And so we would have an equation for the position. And here's where I want to be careful. When I say that, most people say, well, sure, just move the negative and the k to the other side then you solved it for x. Mm, not really. That would be like saying what if I had x minus x cubed equals 4 and somebody says solve for x. Oh, well that's easy. x equals 4 minus x cubed. I would say you really haven't solved for it because you can't figure out what x is because you need x to solve for what x is. And so technically you have an equation that says x equals, but it's written in terms of the x's and that's not very useful. That's what's actually happening here. It, it may not appear that way, but how would I describe the acceleration? Now, this goes to my warning again. Remember, I'm not going to give you any new physics here today, but I am going to go back to many of the things that we did. And this would take us all the way back to chapter two in kinematics. Isn't there a mathematical connection between position, velocity, acceleration, and time? Do you remember that? Now, I don't, I'm not talking about those four or five constant acceleration kinematics equation. In fact, maybe I should pause. Is this a constant acceleration problem? Could I use any of those? No. Right? No, I can't. And I know that because the force is not constant. I know that because the equation for the force or the little experiment we did says that the force changes with position. So the forces keep changing, which means the acceleration keeps changing. And so any of those equations that we called the five kinematic equations that were valid only for constant accelerations, we can't use those, which is really too bad because then this would be easy to solve. <laughs> so instead, we have to go back to that little diagram. Do you remember the derivatives? Remember I said the derivative of position is the velocity? That's always true. 
And then we said in the special case, when it's a constant, and then we solved it, and that's how we got those five kinematic equations. And I know that was a long time, but I know you've been reviewing for the final. You've had plenty of free time, I'm sure, with all the other labs and homeworks to start studying and reviewing for the final. Obviously, I'm joking, but when you start reviewing for the final, you'll, you'll recognize that. You'll recognize that way back in chapter two, we had this equation that connects them. And so what I want to do is then say, this is actually the derivative of the velocity. But I also want to go even, also in that chapter, how do we get velocity? Wasn't the velocity the derivative of the position? Okay, so we have the derivative of velocity, but velocity is derivative of position. Ooh. This is what I was trying to say that when I say let's solve this for x, let's see if we can describe where the object is, this doesn't cut it. This doesn't really solve it because to figure out where the object is, we would need to know where the object is. <laughs> And that's as silly as this. This, this doesn't really solve for x because we can't really figure out what x is because we have to know what x is in order to solve for what x is. And so I would say this doesn't quite do it. However, let's kind of simplify this a little bit. And so let me work some calculus with you. Uh, that's called the second derivative. Does that make sense? You take the derivative one time and then the second time. And so if I come over here and maybe I'll get rid of that equation and say, all right, so I have x equals, and it looks like I've got a minus m over k, and then the second derivative. And so I thought I would take a moment to kind of remind you what a second derivative is, how we write it. Okay, so we haven't done anything quite like this. We, we did some single derivatives a few times and then separated the variables and integrate them. In fact, we, we did that for Newton's Law of Cooling yesterday in the lab. Okay. But that was a single derivative. And those are easier than a second derivative. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, why don't we solve this one, not so much in a formal way, but just use our experience and what we remember from calculus. Uh, let me take one more step. Let me move the k and the m and the negative together with the x. And when you write it this way and stand back and read it, you, you guys might be able to answer this for me. What is this really saying? This is saying you have some kind of function. You take its derivative twice, and then that is supposed to equal what? Well, I'd say there's three things here, but I'll start with x. In other words, you take its derivative twice and you get back the same function? What would that be? I mean, if I had y equals to x to a power of 3, what would I get if I took its derivative twice? Well, I guess the first time I would get 3x squared the next time, I guess I would get a 6x. That is not the same thing. That is not an x cubed. In fact, anything raised to a power, each time you lower it by 1. So there's no way the answer to this equation can be x raised to any power. Right? Impossible. Anything from your calculus class sound familiar? A what? It can be 1. Well, can't... 
Well, if, you, if it was one, if it is any constant, you take its derivative twice, you end up with zero. So I guess it couldn't be a constant, unless you want to go with the boring with zero. You take zero and take its derivative twice, you still get zero. Okay, so if this thing is at position zero, it'll stay at position zero. Yep, there it is, there's the solution. So that's what we call the trivial solution. Kind of boring, correct, yes, but not really what we're after. We're after that solution. Well, what is its position? So this is the part that I thought I better help you a little bit with the calculus because I wanted to point out that raised to a power is not going to do it. Can you think of any other functions? Uh, maybe e to the x? Sounds familiar? So what happens if you take the derivative of e to the x? You get e to the x. Do it again. You get e to the x. Ooh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Maybe we're on a roll here. So e to the x, if I take its derivative twice, I get the same thing back. Okay, okay. I, I kind of like that. Except remember, it's not just x. It's also something out in front here. It's also a negative. So let's keep thinking. How about this thing out in front? How would I get something in front of this? Well, again, if you think kind of a, how the calculus works, what if I had the chain rule like e to the, I'll call it ax. Go ahead, take the first derivative of this. What are you going to get? Aren't you going to get e to the ax? And then the chain rule says an a? A number out in front. Oh, I like where this is going, right? This is saying, if I take its derivative twice, I'm going to get something out in front and the same function back. Let's try it again. Let me do, let me do a second derivative. So e to the ax, and then there would be another a. Nice. Right? I, I, I take it through twice, I, I get that same function, I get a number out in front, uh-oh. But I don't get a negative in front. Hmm. That was close. And so, should I try E? to the negative ax? Sadly, that just misses it also. It's close. But the first derivative is e to the negative ax and then a negative a. But when you do that a second time, you get negative a squared, which is back to the same function. So I would have said, if there wasn't a negative in front of this, I would say we know the answer. It's e to the ax. But there is a negative sign. Anything else comes to mind from your calculus? Hmm. What if I have cosine x? What is the derivative of cosine? minus sine. Now take the derivative of that, what do you get? Minus. So I'll leave the minus alone, but derivative of sine is <gasps> cosine. We're back where we started. And we have a negative. Oh, this is looking good. But wait, it doesn't have something out in front. Answer. Yeah, how about y equals cosine, and I'll try the same thing, ax. How about that? And maybe just to speed us along a little bit, maybe I'll put amplitude in front. And so I'll ask again, if I take the derivative of the first time, what do I get? 
Well, I'd leave the A alone. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. With the chain rule gives me a A out in front. Derivative again, the sine becomes a cosine with the A both a's actually unaffected the negative and the chain rule gives me another little a squared and I think I got it now isn't this right here the original function aren't we saying that if you take the derivative of this you will get the original function you will get some number in front and you'll get a negative negative. and that's exactly what I need by the way, maybe to speed things along, it would work also with sine. Because the derivative of sine would be cosine, derivative of cosine would be negative sine. So you get back where you started with a negative. So this is my long way of saying that if we don't do anything new, but we put together... I guess this would be Hooke's Law of Chapter 7. It would be Newton's Law of Chapter 4. It would be the derivatives and the kinematics of Chapter 2. If we put those three things together, we can describe the motion of something connected to a spring. It would fit this equation. And the solution, then, must be something that looks like this. Let me leave that on the board and come over to here. But this is the part I wanted to help you with. To say, let's solve that equation. And so I'll say it again, no new physics, but a new force, a force from a spring. And you can see we end up with a hard mathematical equation. And you can see why then we didn't do this back in chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. We waited until you had a little more expertise under you. And so now we're in chapter 16. But I am claiming then that the position as a function of time would equal what? All right, so I'm going to say it again. What function could you take its derivative twice and end up with the function, with a number in front, and with a negative? And hopefully you see it right here. It could be either a cosine or a sine. Now, of course, I used x and y because I was talking about trying to remind you of your calculus class where you probably wrote a function of y as a function of x or the function y as a function of x. So let's translate that to what we want. We want to know the position as a function of time. So I'm going to replace the y with x because I want to know where it is on the x-axis. And again, in math, the y just meant a dummy variable. It didn't really mean vertical. It just meant that's what we're plotting. So for us, physically, I want this, the function, to be where is it? Okay. And here, it would be a function of time. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. The solution for where this object is, x as a function of time, would be equal to... And it must have either a cosine or a sine. Why don't I just pick on a cosine? And so I'm going to put cosine, and it's got to have a t in it. So makes sense that the position changes with time. And again, if you kind of look at this, there must be some kind of number, which in a trig class, when we'll talk about this, we call this the amplitude. So your author calls this a capital X. And then as I said, I've got the cosine. And again, I use the X here, not as position, but as a dummy variable from your calculus class. So that would be time. But look at this. This A would be something in front. But notice, we can figure out what that thing is in front because we can look at after we take the derivative we would have a squared. So if we look at this, after we take the derivative, we got a k over m. So that means this little a must be the square root of k over m. 
So I guess this would be the square root of k over m. And that should do it. That is the solution. And so here, like I said, here's the good news. It might have been a little more advanced math than we've seen for a while into getting this solution, but it, what, I'm not going to ask you to solve it ever again other than to say, what's the solution to this equation? Here it is. And so if I were to plot the position as a function of time, Let's, let's read the math. Let's do the math. And I think you can kind of see it in here, right? If I, if I were to pull this to one side right here and let it go, see how it oscillates? Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Isn't that what a cosine function does? I mean, a cosine function does exactly this. It starts at some maximum and goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And I guess I would say now I feel comfortable with my mathematical solution. Uh, I never looked at the object while I was trying to solve this, but now that I've solved it, when I come back and look at the object, I'm very happy that I got a cosine function. If I would have gotten something else that, you know, was like that exponential, you know, an exponential does this, and that means it would go x, 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 and never come back, and that's not what this does. This goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And so fortunately, after all this work, the math it does seem to match what seems to go on when I put an object on a spring. And in fact, let's do some more math review. Isn't this what we call the amplitude? Isn't that this x? And if I was actually wanting to know a value for x, if I came over here and did this, if I came over here and told you that I'm going to pull it two centimeters and let it go then I would know that that capital X is two centimeters that is the amplitude and let's take a look at this crazy stuff the square root of K over M what's neat about a trig function is it repeats itself. So it starts here at a positive value for capital X, then it goes negative, then it comes positive, and I would call that one cycle. Isn't our whole trig class, right, about it repeating, it being a cycle? So let me define this. Let me call capital T the period. Oh, we might call that the time for one cycle. Because this is always a fun question. How long will it take for one cycle? How long will it take to go back and forth? Well, I guess if you remember from your uh, trig class, doesn't the cosine function repeat every 2 pi? So this right here, when that's 2 pi, would that be the repeat? In other words, when the square root of k over m times the period, see, one period, so if I put in a time of one period, shouldn't I get 2 pi? That, that's when a trig function repeats itself, or at least a, a cosine function. I, I know the tangent functions have a different cycle, but the sines and cosines repeat every 2 pi. And so I can answer not only this first question about what is the equation for the position of it, but I can answer another question, which is what is the equation for the period of a mass connected to a spring? And so here we got what I guess I'll call the second nice equation that really works out, I guess, from this first equation, which is the solution to 
I'll call this the fundamental equation, so we won't, you know, need to really kind of look at that one again. But now that we've solved this, I would claim that this right here is really going to answer all of my questions about this motion. How long does it take? What is its frequency? What is its amplitude? What is its velocity? What is its acceleration? I mean, there's a lot of things I can ask about the motion of this little object on a spring. And I would say Newton's law answered them all for me. And so all you've got to do is write down Newton's laws and then solve. And so I've done that. I've got this position. Uh, maybe I should have put a box around it. So here is the equation for the position on a, of a mass with a, with a spring. Now, just to illustrate, notice this says the period depends upon two factors. How much mass and how strong is the spring. That's the spring constant. Now, I can't really change my spring constant over here, but I can change the mass really easy. So, again, watch it go back and forth. But then, let me put some more mass on here. I wonder how much I can get on here before it scrapes the bottom. That's a lot of mass. Can you tell it takes a long time now to go back and forth? The period is longer. The time for one cycle. Which, by the way, this will be the lab today. In the lab today, we will start piling on a bunch of masses on the spring and measure them and so you can get a, a better feel for this equation. But that is the time, like I said, to go back and forth. In fact, if I take all of them off, you'll probably see a small time right there because now I just have the small mass of the cart as it goes back and forth. And so again, the time is dependent on, on this. Now, with that in mind, what if the spring was vertical? So instead of that contraption, what if I have this contraption? Yeah, and maybe I'll just take, looks like I got 200 grams here and I'll hook it on. what would happen with what I call a vertical spring compared to a horizontal spring? Well, here's some good news. And maybe you could actually see it in the setup when I connected it. Uh, our free body diagram, which I've since erased, uh, would have had a vertical force instead of just the force from the spring. However, maybe you saw something interesting here. I'll do it again. I've got it vertical, and when I took the mass on here, did you notice it kind of stretched a little bit until it balanced right here? I would say at this point, if we call this zero, I mean, really, this is the zero, right? This is the natural length of the spring. This is the, the, what I'd call the true zero from Hooke's law. But if we imagine kind of a reset in our mind and call this zero, at this point, the force of gravity is exactly balanced by the additional stretching of the spring. And since those balance each other, let's forget about them. Let's forget that the spring is actually stretched. That's why I'm going to call this a new zero. And let's also forget about gravity. And if I do that, the motion of a vertical spring and the motion of a horizontal spring are really the same thing then. The only thing about a vertical spring is I need to say the zero spot is not the natural length of the spring anymore. The zero spot is the new equilibrium. Because it's at this point where the extra stretching of the spring, which we can ignore if we also ignore the force of gravity. So there's the good news. We won't make a distinction then. We'll save horizontal springs and vertical springs have that same overall behavior. Now, vertical springs then can get a little tricky because what if instead
of hanging 200 grams, I hang only 100 grams. Do you see the smaller mass doesn't stretch it as far? But if you still call that zero, then it acts just like a horizontal spring. And so the zero for a vertical spring is different for different weights. That's the only tricky thing about vertical springs. See, look at this big heavy weight. That would be the zero spot. That would be what we're gonna call the equilibrium spot. And if we do this, it moves back and forth. So the good news here is we don't really need to go through all the stuff we just went through for a vertical spring. It works just as well for the horizontal spring. Okay, that's a lot less work. In fact, let's keep talking about the motion of all of these because what if I were to ask you for, say, the equation of the velocity of this object? Could you give me the equation for the velocity? Could you give me the equation for its acceleration? Could you give me the equation for its kinetic energy? Could you give me the equation for the elastic energy in the spring? And I think you can. Oh, let me start with the velocity. How would I get the velocity as a function of time? Isn't that the derivative of position? And isn't that what we just spent a lot of effort to do, is to get the equation for position? So let me, let me help you with the calculus. Let's take the derivative of this. So let me take the derivative of some amplitude times cosine square root k over m times t. And you guys actually already did this for me. What's the derivative of a cosine? Negative sine. And then, don't forget the chain rule, right? So then I would get the square root of k over m. And I don't know if you want to call this equation number three, or you just want to take the derivative of equation number one. That's kind of a choice that you're going to have to make because I don't want you to memorize a whole bunch of equations. But on the other hand, maybe that's easier for you than taking a derivative. I don't know. Could you give me the equation for the acceleration of this mass? And isn't the acceleration just the derivative of the velocity? And so maybe it's worth repeating again, I said about an hour ago that, hey, we're going to do some pretty high level mathematics, some stuff you haven't seen before, but I'm gonna do it with you, <laughs> okay? And so you're not gonna have to take these derivatives now that we are, you know, or you, you can. Uh, but let me give you the equation for the acceleration. So. Uh, help me out here uh, again. Um, maybe I'll just say all these constants are left alone when you take its derivative. Uh, what's the der <coughs> excuse me? What's the derivative of a sine? Yeah, cosine. Of course, let me also remind you. Then there's also the chain rule. So the chain rule would give me another square root of k over m, and I already have one out here, so maybe I'll just put squared. And then maybe I'll simplify it. So the equation for the acceleration would become a negative k over m times the amplitude times cosine of the square root of k over m t. Oh. And so, maybe I'll call that equation number four. <laughs> but as you can now see, I have an equation for the position of it, for the velocity, and for the acceleration. 
I also have an equation for it, period. I, I guess I could go on and say, could you give me the equation for the force? Wouldn't the force be mass times acceleration? An acceleration we just got. And so I'll just multiply it by m, and so that'll actually cancel it off. And so we get a minus k times amplitude cosine square root of k over m t. And maybe I'll put a little box around that. And I forget what equation we're at now. Five. But you can see we could go on and on and we could ask for things like the energy. And I will here. Oh, but we have a nice equation. Now, let me give another equation because there is something that we like to do. It's called the frequency. And that might be a new word for some of you. Way back here, I said period and I defined it as the time for one cycle and um, most people they kind of get that they go yeah that's you know that's what a cycle is that's one time we even did a few of that with Kepler's law and the gravitational motions of chapter six here frequency actually sounds a lot like period but it is different uh, we like to say it's the number of cycles per one second. And I hope you can kind of see what I'm going to call the reciprocal, right? This, this is saying a period is the time per cycle. The reciprocal of that is the number of cycles per time. Uh, so if I come back over to here, I could look at this and say, all right, this goes back and forth pretty quickly. So maybe in one second, I'll go one, two, three, maybe about three times in one second. So I would say the frequency is three, three cycles in one second. Now, another way of saying the same thing is the time for one cycle is a third of a second, right? They're, they're reciprocal of each other. If it goes back and forth three times in one second, that's its frequency, three times in one second. The reciprocal of that is one-third of a second is the time for one cycle. So this is just a way of saying, let me use the symbol little f for frequency and then point out that it's the reciprocal of the period. So then I would have an equation for the frequency of this by realizing, and maybe I'll put it over here, I started to write it over there, but it might be nice to have the two of these real close to each other. So realizing if you know one, you know the other. In fact, maybe I should put a box around the definition here. And so over here, if I take the reciprocal of this, I get one over two pi for the reciprocal of this one. And this one, when I take the reciprocal, the K goes on top and the M goes down below. So again, there's a lot we can ask about the motion of this mass on the end of a spring. And we, can have, we have a lot of equations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them so far. And then that fundamental one, which I'm not even going to count because that was what led to these. And that's what I want to get at is the, the result of these. So again, we could ask a lot of questions here about things like, you know, what is the position five seconds after I let it go? Okay, well, since it said position, I guess I would come over here and put in five. And assuming we know the spring constant and the mass uh, and the amplitude, we could calculate where it is in five seconds. And likewise, we could ask for what's the velocity after five seconds, what's the acceleration after five seconds, what's the force after five seconds. Something that doesn't have anything to do with time is we could ask what's the frequency of this mass or what's the period of this mass on the spring. And so there's a lot we can answer from working out Newton's second law. And that's, again, what I want you to see. Now, 
We could also ask the reverse. This, this would actually be a challenging piece of mathematics, but not unreasonable. You might say, what is the time when it is at position 5 centimeters? Well, of course, to do that, we'd have to put in 5 centimeters here. We'd have to make sure our units for amplitude match the centimeters, but then we would have to take the inverse cosine or the arc cosine and solve it. By the way, did you notice something here? If you multiply all these out, there's no units. Meaning what? Meaning this is a real number, no units. Meaning my calculator needs to be in what mode? Radians. Did you catch that? Did you remember we said one cycle was what? 2 pi. Did you notice I said one cycle was 2 pi radians? I did not say it was 360 degrees. I'm not working in degrees here. I'm working in radians. Right? Remember we did with our motion? Remember we said radians is not a unit? Right? It's just kind of a clarification. This would be your clue. That we've solved everything with numbers. We did not use this divide a circle into some kind of fraction based on the number of days in a year, the 360. We didn't, we didn't do that. These were just real numbers. And I wanted to point that out because I know that's always a challenge for students. They're looking at their calculator going, oh, is my calculator supposed to be in degrees and radians? I, I don't know. How do I, how do I tell? And that's what I'm trying to tell you. This is how you tell. <laughs> you look at the units. This is our unit analysis. This is back to chapter one. And so there are no units here. That means radians. If it meant degrees, there would be a unit of degrees in here. And we don't have that. Now, maybe, I guess I got to clear off something. I kind of wanted to leave all this, this up here. But we should talk about then the energy as this thing goes back and forth. Um, actually, maybe I'll just clear off this graph and then maybe up here and over here and I'll try to work around these equations, although it might not be too important over here. But what about kinetic energy? Isn't that little mass, as it goes back and forth, have a changing kinetic energy? Because its velocity is changing? That's why I wanted to leave this equation right here, right? This velocity says it changes with time. And it's a sine function. So that means its kinetic energy would change. And then that's, I don't think, a surprise. If I come over here and just shake it, you can kind of see that. When it gets all the way over to one side, it actually comes to a stop. No kinetic energy. Then it gets back to the middle. It has a lot of kinetic energy. Then it gets over here to the other side and stops. No kinetic energy. And then a lot. And then none. And then a lot. And then none. And then a lot. And then none. And so not a surprise then that I would expect to see a sine squared function. So if I was plotting kinetic energy as a function of time, I guess with a sine squared, it would look like that. A lot, nothing, a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing. Well, that kind of makes sense. But also, isn't there an energy for the stretched spring? Wouldn't there be a one-half kx squared? This is that first section we reviewed for the energy in the spring. And of course, here's the equation for the position. It, it has a cosine, and it's a cosine squared. Uh, maybe I'll change colors, but hopefully, again, that's not a surprise because, again, it would go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And so the elastic energy, 
as it goes back and forth. When it goes over here to the far side, it has a lot of elastic energy, which makes sense because it has no kinetic energy. But then when it gets back in the middle, it has a lot of kinetic energy, but no elastic energy. Oh, then it goes to the other side, and it has no kinetic energy, but a lot of elastic energy. And so the elastic energy goes a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing. And so there's this constant, if you want to say, flow of energy from one form to another. And what do we know about the total energy? It stays the same. That's the principle of conservation of energy. And you can probably see it here in the math. Aren't you really adding a sine squared plus a cosine squared? You remember that trig identity? Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. It doesn't change. Sine squared changes and cosine squared changes, but they change exactly the same amount that the total remains the same. And so if I were to make a plot here of the total energy, I hopefully won't be too surprised to see a constant for the total energy when I add the two together. And so I would say this equals a constant doesn't change. In fact, I might be real easy to find this constant. One way to find the constant is to say, think about this spring when it's all the way to the left or all the way to the right. At that point, it has no kinetic energy. It has all elastic energy. And the spring has stretched its maximum, its amplitude, that thing, the capital X. So this must equal one-half K times capital X squared. Now I'm going to take advantage of this principle of conservation of energy because watch this. If you look at these three terms, they each have a one-half in them. So let me cancel that off. And if I move this KX squared to the other side, I will get an mv squared equals k capital X squared minus a k little x squared. So just for clarity, remember the capital X is the maximum it moves over. This is the amplitude. The x is where it is at that moment, and so it goes back and forth. So, so this changes with time, and this does not. Uh, now, if I divide everything by m, and then take the square root, recognizing that each term has a k and an m in it, I get kind of a useful equation that says, what is the velocity based upon position? Did you catch that? Don't confuse it with this. What, what is this one saying? This is the velocity based upon time. In fact, maybe this sounds familiar a little bit. Do you remember doing problems like this? We, we would say, take a ball, hold it up in the air, and when we were doing chapters 2 and 3, we said something like this. What is the speed of the ball after 3 seconds? Right? We used acceleration. We used kinematics for that. It was based on time. And so we had a formula to figure out the velocity based on time. But then when we got to the energy, we, we changed that thinking. We said, all right, you take a ball and you drop it. How fast is it going after it falls three meters? So instead of three seconds, it's three meters. The number is the same, but one is a time and one is a distance. And when we did that one, we did energy for it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say here. The math, it looks a little more difficult. And it is, rightfully so. But the concept is still the same. You are going to get questions that says, what is the speed after three seconds? But you're also going to get questions that say, what is the speed when it is at a position of three? You see the difference? And if they ever ask you for based on time, you use kinematics. If they ever ask you based upon position, you use energy. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were pointing at the periodic table. No. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm missing something. All right. So, with that, of course, in mind, I hope. <laughs>
all of the kinematics and the conservation of energy that we did for the simpler problems, if I can dare say that, comes back to you. Because I'd say we haven't done anything new. We've just done a harder situation. And I don't even know if it's physically harder, but mathematically it certainly is. Mathematically because we had that second derivative and we had to solve that and we had to take other derivatives. It looks really hard. And I'll say it again, here's the good news. Go ahead and make this list. Your author summarizes it. And, and this, I think, is everything that they'll ask about it. Now, I must admit, they're trig functions. And in the past, students have been not as strong with their trig functions as they are with their algebra. And so they look at this and go, ooh. And that's why I wanted to give you the warning about make sure your calculator's in radians, okay? Because it's easy to overlook that. Well, in fact, your author takes yet another step here and says, what if we look at something a little different? Instead of a spring, let's just take a mass on the end of a string. We call this a pendulum. A simple pendulum, to be more exact. And so here is your author's diagram. He says, okay, let's take this diagram and let's go ahead and look at what would happen if we had a mass at the end of a string. So, not a surprise, I happen to have a little mass on the end of a string that I can set up. Maybe I'll make it about this long. In fact, I can change how much mass by adding to it. Uh, I can't really take anything away from this. this. This by itself is about 40 grams. So I'm just going to start off with maybe putting 100 on each side to kind of balance it. Again, the exact amount is not an issue. I just want to point out I can change it, and I will change it. But here I'll just start with, looks like 240. I've got the 100, 100, and a, and a 40. And I pull it to one side and I let it go. And could you tell me kind of all the same things we just did for that mass on the spring? Could you tell me its position? Could you tell me its velocity? Could you tell me its acceleration? Could you tell me its force? Could you tell me its period? Could you tell me its frequency? Could you tell me its equation for the velocity based on position, not just on time like the other one? In other words, all those equations. Could we work out all those equations for this scenario? And we can. Unfortunately, it's not really too hard. Yeah. Wouldn't you have to consider gravity if there's no like, shrinkage of the spring or stretch of the spring? Because you know how that was going to be zero, so you could pretty much just not consider gravity because of that reason. Oh, there's yeah. no deviation between spring and <gasps> Okay. Right, so I think, I think what you're saying here is there is similarities and differences between this and this. So this one has a mass that moves back and forth, and so does this one. So I'd say that's similar. What is different, though, is here, this one is getting restored by the force from the spring. This one is getting restored by the force of gravity. And so it's gravity that pulls it back and forth. So I would expect there to be some differences in our equation. And that's what I want to point out. We can actually then make this a fairly easy problem here. It'll be a perfect one to do and then take our break. Is if we say, how is this slightly different but also very similar to that one? And then we can take all those equations and modify them slightly. And so let, let's give that a try. So I'll come over here and pick maybe a different color. Let me clear the board here of all the other stuff other than the end results. Uh, could have left that energy one there. That might have been helpful. But let me kind of work around this because I would say that if I drew a free body diagram like your author is trying to draw there and say, okay, I've got 
some kind of support up at the top. I've got a vertical line. I pull it off to the side here and I want to look at the back and forth motion realizing that there is a force of gravity pulling it down. Uh, I suppose I might say there is a tension pulling it up. But I'm hoping you will let me say, like the spring, the spring had vertical forces, but we didn't pay any attention to that. That's what this tension is doing. This tension is just keeping this little mass from, you know, shooting out or falling down. It's this component of gravity. And so I will write the force of gravity like this. There is a piece of the force of gravity restoring it and a piece of gravity pulling on the string. So let me not worry about the piece of gravity that's pulling on the string or worry about the force from the string. I would say this, if, as long as the string is strong enough, we don't break the string. So we could put too much weight on there and break it. So I have to give some thought to how much weight I put on there. But what I do want to point out is this is right here. This right here is the restoring piece. This is the piece that is equivalent to our spring. And if we call this angle up here theta, and maybe we put a grid over here. And let's see if I can argue this well. Uh, this theta is between the vertical and the string. So down here, gravity is the vertical and this is supposed to be the component in parallel or in line with this string. So this is theta. And so this restoring piece right here would be the amount of gravity, mg, and it would be opposite of theta. So the amount pulling it back is mg sine theta. And notice it's in the negative direction. So if you let me, and uh, hmm, I don't know if I can fit this in before a break, but we'll see what we get. But I'll go the sum of the forces, and let's say the x direction, okay? So the sum of the forces in the x direction. So let me let me let me say restoring it back is the x direction. I would say that this force is minus mg sine theta. And then over here on this side, I would say this is m times the second derivative. And you're seeing that I'm essentially doing the same thing we did an hour ago, where I had a minus kx here, and then equals to ma. I just now have this piece. So you can see that we're going to get the same solution, or almost. I, I do have another important step to do, uh, too. A minor one is to cancel off the masses. The big step, though, is right here to say what sine theta. Now, let me not look at this angle anymore. Let me look at this angle. Because I would define sine theta as the, this big triangle and the opposite, this is its position x, over the hypotenuse, and let me call this L, the length of the string. So I'm going to replace sine theta with x over L. And like we did an hour ago, but now let's not take so much time to solve it, let's look closely at this equation. 
This equation is the second derivative of position with respect to time, okay, equals, and let's rearrange this. Do you see how I have a negative? Do you see I ha how I have a g over an l? And do you see then I have the x? And so I'm going to ask the same thing that we asked an hour ago, so we don't have to do all this math again. What function could you take its derivative twice and end up with these three things? That is, the original function, some number out in front, and a negative. Isn't that how we got this? Now, maybe I'll rewrite up here the equivalent of this equation. I called it the fundamental equation. We had a minus k over mx equals the second derivative. And I would say then this pendulum is identical to the spring if you take k over m and you replace it with g over l. So right here, what would be the equation for the position? Well, I guess it would be some amplitude, so however far you pull it to the left or the right, then it would be cosine. And then you would get a g over l instead of a k over an m times t. And so there would be the equation for position. Could you give me the equation for velocity? Well, hopefully you get a minus the square root of g over l times the amplitude times sine square root of g over l times t. And let me save a little time since we're getting close to our, our break, but could I do the same thing here? Yeah, could I do the same thing here? The one I really want to focus some attention on then are these three. Could you give me the equation for the period of a pendulum? How much time would it take? Well, it would be a 2 pi times the square root. And let's see, I think this is uh, inverted, right? Um, so it must be L over G. So this would be an L over a G. And then this would be 1 over 2 pi times the square root of G over L. And I know we're coming up to break time here. I haven't forgotten here, but I want to, again, two quick things. Notice then that this equation and the pendulum is a little different in the sense that the spring, the period depended upon how much mass you have and the strength of the spring. But for the pendulum, notice mass is not even in here. But length is. And so is the force of gravity. Now that doesn't surprise us because I would say this G is like this K. Remember the, the, the K was the spring constant pulling it back to equilibrium and G is this gravitational acceleration pulling it back. So it doesn't surprise me that it would depend upon what planet you're on, right? What, what, what gravity is. Just like it would depend on what spring you have. But this one is interesting because it depends on its length and not its mass, whereas the spring depended upon its mass. And you can kind of see that here. If I take this pendulum and I pull it to one side, and I very roughly measure its period, I might go, ready, start, one, one thousand, two, one. All right, so not quite two seconds. Let me change its mass. And I'll change it by quite a bit. It was 240. Now it's only 40. Well, that's a big change. Let's try it again. Pull it over and let it go. Ready? One, oh, I'm sorry. Begin. One, 1,000, two, one. And about the same time. 
And so the period didn't depend upon the mass. Notice, though, it does depend on the length. I mean, watch what happens if I make this, say, a shorter length. And now I let it go. Look how much shorter the period is. That would be the equivalent of what I showed you earlier by changing the mass. Well, one last thing, and we'll take our break, and then we'll go on to waves when we come back from the break. But one that deserves a little more thought is this one. Because here I have the, well, I guess I shouldn't say more thought, but needs to be pointed out. And I was doing this in blue, so let me come back to here. Is to say then the speed of this. And so I'm going to replace the K over M with the G over L. And so I'll get G over L, and I will get then the amplitude squared minus the position at that moment squared for the velocity. Uh, maybe that was too easy. Maybe I didn't need to point that out. All right, well, this will be a great time for our, 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 our break here. So we've done a lot of information about things oscillating. And we're going to extend this then into waves. All right, so you online people, I'll see you in 15. All right. Uh, welcome back. Uh, Hope you got a little bit of rest, and I know we're getting to that point in the semester where it seems like you can't have any rest, and let me reassure you, it's true. You won't get any more rest, at least for another week, and so we'll kind of uh, wrap it up here. Uh, but let's finish up this chapter, chapter uh, 16, and the other half of this chapter is about waves. But during the break, and so for you online people, I got into a little discussion that I thought maybe I should expand on, and it has to do with that value of x with the pendulum. And so let me draw a pendulum here for a moment. And so if we have the pendulum somewhere off to the right, and we say this is the distance x, you could roughly say that it's the same as that arc. And so the two things that came up on the break was if we are saying x is approximately equal to the arc, I'll call it s, we had also need to say that this angle of swing needs to be reasonably small. Uh, we call this the small angle approximation. I like to say 30%. If you pull a pendulum more, 30%, 30 degrees. If you pull a pendulum more than 30 degrees, 30 degrees is about a half a percent off. So all of our equations are about a half a percent off at 30 degrees. And so if you're willing to stay under that, then our equations are pretty accurate. But we kind of treated these as one and the same, and they're not really. But you can see they're very close with a small angle. So that was one thing that I just wanted to add. I don't know if it's real important. Your author talks about it. And then he, everything we do is always a small angle. So I thought I'd mention it in passing. But the more important one was to say then if this x is approximately the same as s, and s is an arc length, and we call l the length of the string, and this would go back to our circular motion, or chapter 10, I could say then that the angle theta is the arc length over the radius, which would be the length of the string. So I could replace s with theta times l. And if you do that in this equation, you get an equation that your author has. And I think that's why this came up as a question, because they said, well, the equation you gave us isn't quite the same as what the author gave us. And I want to show you it, it, it is here. And so this would be the amplitude squared. 
and then minus, and so right here, I'm going to replace the x with approximately an s. So I'm going to replace s with approximately an l squared theta squared. And what's nice about that, and I can see why your author does this, is now you are giving the equation of the velocity based upon the length of the pendulum and the angle that it, that it swings. Okay? And same warning I gave before the break. And look what we're using. So your angle needs to be in units of radians. Mm -hmm. And so be careful and to always look at how these equations are, are set up and that'll tell you whether you're supposed to be in degrees or radians. All right, well, let's now take the next natural step and talk about waves. And I would describe waves really as a collection of oscillations one oscillating next to the other. The whole reason we did these oscillations, and let's just take that spring again, if I pulled the mass to one side and let it go, it just oscillated, right? But what if right next to it was another oscillator? And next to that one was another oscillator? And next to that one was another oscillator? See, what could happen then is as I shake this one, it might transfer its energy to the next one. So the first one actually stops oscillating and the second one starts. And then that might transfer its energy to the third one. So the second one stops and the third one begins. And so what ends up happening is the energy moves from one oscillator to another oscillator to another oscillator. So we have this movement or this flow of energy, but not the material itself. Did you catch that? See, if we go back to our kinematics, if I just had a baseball and I throw the baseball across the room, I would say that what went across the room, I would say energy and mass. Material. Energy and material went across the room. As you'll see here, our fundamental definition of a wave is the energy moves, but not the material. Uh, it's probably best seen with this machine. We call this a wave machine. You can probably see it's made out of some metal rods just sticking out. And they're actually hooked with a little spring right here. So if I only had one by itself and I pulled it up and let it go, it would do this. It would oscillate. But what it, I have is a connection to all of them. And so if I start the first one, it'll give its energy to the second one, which the second one then gives it to the third one, and the third one to the fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and seventh, and eighth, and so far, actually until they run out, and then the last oscillator can't give it to anything other than it will call reflects the wave. The energy instead of going to the next one kind of runs to a dead end and if I can say ricochet for a moment, reflect is a better word, the energy then goes back the other way. And so it's kind of fun to just watch as the wave goes from one to another. But I want to emphasize and we've kind of painted the end of the rods white, so you can kind of see the end of them. And as they move, notice that never did this rod actually move down. The material did not move. The energy did. And if there was something down here, or maybe a little tiny ant sitting here, we could actually then transfer energy to this little tiny ant. This ant actually got the energy. The energy initiated with me, and I transferred it by a wave to the other end, and so this is our flow of energy. So water waves, sound waves, light waves. We like to call these rod waves. Kind of boring, but that's this idea. Energy flows, but not the material. Ah, good point. Good, great point, actually. And so in a moment, 
I'll get uh, this right here I'm gonna call really not a wave but a wave pulse it's just one little oscillation but if I did I think what you're saying is if I continued to move up and down we would get something more complicated and if you were to look at just one of them it would be this cosine up and down then if you look at the pattern spread over space you also have a cosine and so I think what you're saying is we've got two cosine functions going here one over space and one over time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what a wave is so a wave is like an oscillator but it's actually a bunch of oscillators so you have each one oscillating with time but also they are spread out over space yeah. and that's kind of the important difference so a wave would be a function of both space and time whereas a single oscillator just changes with with time it's kind of locked into place okay so if that kind of makes sense then I would say this and so let me kind of draw your author's picture so your author says why don't we just start with water waves you will notice in this chapter that he's kind of vague about which waves purposely he wants to talk about and I want to talk about just the general property of waves so sometimes we use sound waves as an example sometimes we use water waves mostly you use water waves are kind of the easiest one to kind of visualize light waves show up once in a while but sound waves in particular <coughs> gets its own chapter and so chapter 17 we're gonna say let's focus all of our attention to, to sound waves but so right now whether we're talking about water waves or sound waves or light waves it doesn't matter they have the same basic property and I'm gonna draw a picture so I'm gonna put a dotted line and so that represents kind of the equilibrium so like this would be the surface level of the lake when there's no waves then if you disturb it maybe the wind or drop a rock in it you will get exactly what you notice this is a sinusoidal pattern this is a or cosinusoidal depending on where you want to start I started with it down here so I'm gonna call it a sinusoidal pattern but it comes up and goes down and so if you were to take a picture of this a snapshot of it you would see it changes in space with a wave pattern but if you were to watch something and in your author's picture they've got a little duck right here and so that duck right now or I don't know is that a duck or a seagull what do you think maybe I'll go with seagull that looks more and since we're in Santa Barbara we'll call it a seagull all right so it's got a little seagull right here uh, but the seagull is right here and I would say the seagull right now is in the lower part it's in the the trough but what they want you to visualize here is two ways and you touched on them one way is to say if you just focus on the seagull what's gonna happen is the seagull is gonna go up and then back down and then it's gonna repeat up and then back down so the seagull is a single oscillator right this is that what you were saying if you just look at one of these and you focus your attention on this one you're gonna see it go up down up down up down up down as opposed to all of them then you'll see an overall pattern that's also sinusoidal and so we've got two sets of sinusoidal going going on here and so one way of focusing on this is to watch the seagull at one spot and just say it's a single oscillator but another way is to say if the wave is moving along what will happen is this crest will move forward and I'll change colors a little bit uh, where'd my red go and so if I move it to say here then this trough would also move forward which of course this crest over here would move forward uh, which again means this trough moves forward and then lastly this crest would move forward 
And let me emphasize, material did not actually move. What really happened is this part of the water went down. So it's not like the seagull is going to move along in the trough. The water where the seagull is is going to go up and so the seagull goes to there. Now a moment later the wave moves even further and so this crest now becomes here. Which means this trough becomes here. <coughs> Again I just want to say it one more time the wave quote unquote is moving with a velocity v and when I say move the energy moves not the material itself the water molecules are not moving that way the water molecules are oscillating up and down the energy or what you might call the trough or the crest you can kind of visualize the crest having energy because you know it's it's this mass of water that's up here it's got a gravitational potential energy and so this chunk of energy is moving along but it's not the same water this this water here goes down and this water here comes up so it's the same energy over here but not the same water Okay, I hope I said that quite a bit. What flows is the energy. It kind of has a visual picture and looks like the matter is flowing. But that's not really what's happening. And so that's why if I keep drawing this wave, you might think that something physically moved because your focus might be on this crest. And you'll go, well, the crest went from here, and then it goes to here, and then it goes to here but the water itself didn't. If you've been in the ocean, you, you, you notice that right away. You're, you're out there, maybe you're paddling on your surfboard and you see the wave coming in, right? You, you see this mound of water and it keeps coming and it keeps coming and it keeps coming. And it kind of looks like the water's coming in at you. But if you just sit there and the wave goes by you, you know it just kind of lifts you up and puts you down. The water itself never moved. It never pushed you. In fact, if you wanted to catch the wave, you've got to turn around and paddle yourself in order to pick up a speed in order to catch the wave. The water itself is not going to move you. Of course, then it does break, and that's, that's something different. Then it's not, you know, wave. Then it's rolling water. So don't confuse that. I mean, that was a bad example. So with the, the, before the wave breaks, it just it oscillates up and down. So that's our basic idea of the wave. And so all these things we talked about before the break, like amplitude, that would still be here. Where would amplitude be in this picture? And I hope I didn't draw too many on here. Maybe I'll extend it out so that it's kind of clean. But before we went on a break, didn't we say this would be the amplitude? Right? It's from equilibrium up. And so if you just look at this as a single oscillator, and so even though it's a wave, we're going to use the same word. We're going to say the wave has an amplitude. Now here's where you got to be careful with waves and this is what your author is trying to point out is when you look at the seagull then the seagull doesn't go up one amplitude doesn't it go up two amplitudes? See the amplitude is how far did it move from its equilibrium so if we go back before the break and I had this spring if I pulled it over two centimeters and let it go I'm going to say the amplitude's two centimeters but it's actually going to move two to get back to equilibrium and then two more the other direction and so from maximum to minimum it moved two amplitudes right it moved two and two and so that's why your author is trying to say right here here's the capital X here's the amplitude and the total motion from crest sorry crest to trough is two amplitudes but that's why when you, if you are in the ocean and you're out there in the waves and the surf report says oh we're going to have about four foot you think oh four foot that's not much big deal I mean I'm taller than four feet how big can four foot wave be well you got to remember number one 
that's above the water line. So maybe if you're standing on the sandy bottom and you're here, you don't have much above the water. You don't have four feet. But in addition to that, that's the amplitude of it. So if you're waiting for this wave to come and you are now in the trough looking at the crest, you're looking at eight feet above the water line. And that is kind of scary. You're like, oh, okay, that's a lot of water. I better duck. <laughs> and now it seems much bigger because how big is the face? You know, how big does it look from you as you look from the trough up to the crest? So that is, again, same word, amplitude. Also, we would have a period and a frequency, right? And so I just want to emphasize that's the same thing we talked about before the break. This, this is just a series of oscillators. So we could talk about the period of the wave. We could talk about the frequency of the wave. And I just want to say that I probably don't need to say much more about that. We, we, we already talked about that. But there is one new thing. One thing we did not have in the oscillations. And that is... How far do you have to go horizontally in this set of oscillators before it repeats itself? See, when we had one oscillator, we had an amplitude, we had a period, we had a frequency. But what we did not have is a distance until it repeats itself. And that's called the wave length. And so that you can only have with waves. You can't have it for a single oscillator. And so we have something very important to add here, which is its wave length. And we like to symbolize that with the Greek letter lambda. And I think the best way to describe it is to come over here and just point it out here that your author says, look, from the crest to the next crest, that's when it repeats itself. So that would be what we would call the wave length. And it's measured in a distance, so the units are meters, so that's not anything too surprising. I'll kind of put that in here and just say the units are measured in meters. And so we would just say, look, from that crest to the next one, maybe, maybe these are water waves, maybe it's, they're 12 meters apart. We go, okay, so the wavelength is 12 meters or 13 meters or 14 meters, well, well, whatever. If they're sound waves, they'll be maybe more like this. And so maybe we'll say they're 20, 30 centimeters. If they're light waves, well, maybe we'll say they're more like in the hundreds of nanometers. So we'll say 500 nanometers or 600 nanometers. And so all of our waves have a certain wave length. But what I want you to know, the general property is it's the distance to repeat. And even though your author put it crest to crest, wouldn't that be the same as we did trough to trough? And so that's why it's best just to describe the distance to repeat. You could even do, well this one's kind of hard to see, you could see maybe midline to midline. But you'll notice I skipped that one because this is the midline going up. And I want to get to the same thing. So this is midline going down. When I get here, I got midline going up. So it really hasn't repeated yet. Now it starts to repeat. So midline to midline would work as long as you say midline going down to midline going down. So whichever way you want to look at it, I just find it easier like your author, crest to crest. The distance from one crest to another, that's the wavelength but it works for anything when it repeats itself. Now, again, the other piece of this is the velocity of the wave. And again, that is something that we did not have before the break when we just did oscillations. Now, let me clarify that because do you see two different speeds here? I would say one speed is the speed of the oscillator going up and down. And that's what we did do before the break. And so those equations that we did before the break, if you want to apply them to waves, you can. But you're talking about the up and down, the oscillations of it. We're not talking about the velocity and the flow of the energy. And so the two new things that I need to add when we talk about waves are right here. What is the wavelength and what is the velocity of the wave? And of course, when I say the velocity, I would do something like this. How far, say distance, did it travel in a given amount of time? 
and again, let me just emphasize, I am not talking about the velocity that we solved before the break that would have that sinusoidal pattern. And so as it goes up and down, it went fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. I'm talking about the velocity of the energy. And so I'm going to put under here the velocity of the wave. Maybe I'll even say the velocity of the flow of the energy. That, that's what I want to talk about. We already talked about the other velocity. And I want to just point out, that don't confuse them. There, there, there's two real speeds here. Okay, again, the velocity of the oscillation and the velocity of the, of the wave here. Here's kind of nice to talk about waves in general. See, not all waves have the same wavelength. You, you heard me talk about water waves and I was using lengths in the meters, tens of meters. You know, I used 12, 13, 14 meters. And those are typical for our ocean water waves. I did sound waves and those are typically in tens of centimeters. So the 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters. I did light waves, which are usually in the range of hundreds of nanometers. So all of our waves have a different wavelength. So they all have a different distance of waves they travel. They all also travel with a different speed, but there is something I can say that's the same for all waves, whether they be water waves, whether they be sound waves, or whether they be light waves. If you watch them travel one wavelength, and like I said, for light waves that would be a small number, for sound waves it would be kind of a medium number, for water waves it would probably be a bigger number, but if you realize, and so let's talk about this, the time for one wave to travel is also the period. Uh, let's come back to this seagull. See, one way of looking at this seagull is as an oscillator. And so if we start with the seagull in the trough and it goes up and comes down, that's one period. That's, a, that's what we talked about before the break. That's the period of one oscillation. However, if you take the view from a wave, you might say, and I'll make the trough over here, that what's happening is the wave moves over, lifts the seagull up to the crest, then as the wave continues to move, it lowers down and it gets into the next trough. So that's why I would say the period of one oscillation happens at the same rate that one wavelength would flow. This is very useful because it gives me an equation that I can use to connect the speed of the wave, the wavelength of the wave, and the period of the wave. If I know any two of those, I can find the other one. And let me emphasize, this would be true for all waves. This would be true for the water waves, the sound waves, the light waves. It would be true for these rod waves. And so if I were to measure crest to crest, then the time for one cycle, I can then divide those two and get the velocity of these, these waves. Now, let me also point out, the reciprocal of the period is the frequency. So that would mean wavelength times frequency is velocity. And so both of those will be very useful equations. And again, this point of this chapter is not to talk about any type of wave in particular. That's next chapter where we talk about sound waves. And the next semester we'll talk about light waves in great detail. Got something like three chapters on, on light waves. Yeah. And so we will use this for our different waves at different times. But again, notice it's a nice mathematical relationship uh, between all of those. Now, waves also have some really interesting uh, properties that uh, we won't study all the properties in this chapter, but one of the ones that is important and your author wants to emphasize, it's got a big fancy name, it's called superposition. Uh, we could also call it interference. But what is this 
super positioning. Well, I'll tell you, it's nothing real fancy as the word seems to imply. It would be like me asking you, ah, how much money do you have? Well, you might go, all right, uh, in my wallet or purse, I've got $10. Oh, uh, my car, uh, in the little cubby hole there, I got another $3 in change there. Okay, so I'd add them together, right? I'd go, I have 10 plus three. Like, oh, wait, wait, wait. My, my friend, I, I, I borrowed five bucks the other day for, for lunch while we were out. So I, I, I guess I gotta take five dollars off of that. All right, so what am I, how much money do I have? 10 plus three minus five. In other words, I would take everything that makes up this money <laughs> and I would add positives to positives and subtract off the negatives, okay? That's what superpositioning is. Superpositioning is saying waves are not made out of material. They are made out of energy. And when they come together, if one wave says up, so there's your $10, and another wave says up, so there's your $3, and a third wave says down, what's the total that you get? 10 plus 3 minus 5, which I guess, uh, what does that make, 8? All right, so the end result would be 8. But the superpositioning just says take the sum of all of the waves and see what you get. Uh, I think it's best to watch this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a wave pulse, and it's going to go down towards the end and reflect and come back. As it is coming back, I'm going to make a second wave pulse so the two will meet. And I'm going to make them both up. So I get an up. And what does it look like when they meet? Right there. Do you see how when they meet, it says up plus up. And the end result is a big up. And then they pass right through. It's worth watching it again. Because I uh, made one bigger than the other. And so maybe I'll make the first one kind of small. And the second one kind of big. But I want you to see, not only do they come together like this, and then you get a net result, which is the sum of the two, the two waves then travel through each other. They don't bounce off. That's very different. They're not made out of material. This is, this is not like if you have a big one like a softball and a baseball, and they come together and they hit, you don't merge them together and say, I now have a basketball. And you certainly don't say the softball continues to go that way and the baseball goes that way. They, they bounce off. There's material there. Waves don't do that. That's an important property and a difference between the waves. They will just do this. Merge. And it would be like a softball and a baseball becoming a basketball. And then better still, a moment later, they pass through and the softball still goes that way and the baseball goes this way. Let me give it a try. Little wave, big wave. Do you see how when they merge, it's the sum of the two? And do you see how the big one then just kept going through? Now, maybe when it comes to sound waves, that shouldn't surprise you. I mean, I'm sure you've been in a room where many people are talking. And never did I talk with somebody and my friends were talking, did I say, stop, your waves are knocking my waves out of the way and my friend can't hear me. That has never happened. They just went right through each other and my friend over here could listen to me and these two friends could still talk to each other and the waves just passed right by. Yeah. So does the wave passing through keep the same amplitude? Uh, in a perfect world with no friction, yes. Because as we'll see, the amplitude has to do with the energy. So, yeah, they would just pass through, so, yeah. So, oh wait, never mind. I was gonna ask, like, how is it different when it goes, like, we can't, like, a wall can block out sound, but then mm. that's material with energy, so it's not the same as energy with energy. Um, okay, so, I, I guess I would say, notice that this is all the same material, mm -hmm. and then I get to something different, whoops. And when I get to something different, there can be a reflection off of it. Uh, 
So in this case, uh, it goes from a bunch of rods that are all the same to no rods. So the energy bounces off. And that's what would happen with sound waves. The uh, sound, as we will learn in the next chapter, is the movement of the air molecules. So they're bouncing off each other. And as long as it's the same air, everything works great and it keeps going. But when it hits a wall, now it bounces off. And there's a different, what we call median. There's a different material. And so it goes and bounces. And that, that's what happens when you hit a wall. Now, it's too bad I don't have um, more rods that are kind of different, maybe longer. Because what you would see is I would, you would see it probably better representing of a wall. The sound wave would come up. And when it hits something different, maybe most of it reflects. But some of it actually made these big rods move. And so some energy actually goes into the wall and then through the wall. And so somebody on the other side may faintly hear me. I would have to yell pretty loud on this side for them to get enough energy because most of it's going to bounce off. All right, but like I said, this is a fancy word called superpositioning. Your author does a good job of trying to show this. Let's see, picture number 36. He uh, says, well, look at this. He says, if you have uh, wave one and wave two, and he puts the two waves so they're each going up, then you add them together, and this is the result. The ups match ups. I call crest matches crest. Troughs match and troughs. And you just get a bigger result. But if you have something like this, and so he's got wave number one starting up, but wave number two starting down. And if these two waves are merged together, the ups and the downs, so the pluses and the minuses cancel, and you get no result. That's why sometimes we call this interference, because the superpositioning just means add them up, and sometimes the pluses and the minus balance each other, and, and you get no results. Sometimes we refer to that as a destructive interference, whereas the one before that, we refer to it as a constructive interference. But whether you use a fancy word like superposition or interference or constructive or destructive, it's the same general principle that you just kind of add up all the positives and subtract off all the negatives and see at the end result. In fact, it's kind of fun to listen to this one. I'll try this with some sound waves. And so I have this crazy looking thing, which, oh, I guess I set it up over here. Let me put this crazy thing over here because this thing has a speaker in it. And right here is the speaker. And so I've hooked up my oscillator and maybe now you can hear the sound waves. See if you guys on camera can hear the sound waves. Okay. But you will also notice that the speaker sends the waves up and it hits this kind of T and half the energy goes this way and half the energy goes this way. But see how this is longer? And so when they come back together, how they line up, this one, this crest, may not line up with the crest from this one. It may line up with the trough. If they, they perfectly matched up, it would go completely silent. So obviously I don't have a perfect match. But I would say I have a pretty good match between a crest and a trough because if I change the length, Maybe to here, I would say it goes this way, and I have a crest, and here it goes longer, but if it's one wavelength longer, then the crest from this one lines up, and I get something that looked like the earlier picture I had up here, and I get a big amplitude, 
And as what we're going to see is that amplitude is what your ears pick up on how much they're getting hit by the sound waves and so it sounds loud. And so the amount or the volume depends on how I line them up. And so this is about the best I can do when I have constructive and destructive and this somewhere here is where the, the crests line up and that monotone gets a little annoying so I'll, I'll shut that off here and so but there that is my way of trying to say okay what is happening with these waves now I should also point out here especially in our pictures and our sound waves is that there are two categories of waves and again some fancy words here but we have what we call transverse waves and longitudinal waves now notice I said they were waves meaning the energy flows and the transverse I would say is what most people think of when they hear about waves they go oh the energy flows say left and right but the oscillations are up and down see I've been showing you the standard water waves or rod waves those are transverse waves however you can actually get the same idea and it has all these properties of waves but the oscillations are actually in the same direction that the energy travels and so we like put these little yellow dots on here these are sound waves and sound waves are what we call longitudinal waves and again we'll talk more about that in the next lecture but the first molecule bumps into the next which bumps into the next which bumps into the next which bumps into the next so the energy flows horizontally but so are the oscillations and hence the name longitudinal waves but they both have a wavelength they both have an amplitude they both have a period they both have a frequency they both go undergo super positioning and constructive and destructive interference so all the properties are still there it's just a different direction to their oscillations and it makes our graphs look kind of funny because how do you draw something that travels in the X and oscillates in the X well let's not quite go down that road till we get to more of our, our sound waves uh, I like to do this long uh, spring one to show longitudinal ones also because I could do something I'll take this spring and let me keep the tension kind of low otherwise the speed will be so fast and let's see if I can get it from stop shaking but if I take this spring and I compress it a little bit and then let it go can you see how that compression pushes the next, pushes the next, pushes the next? And, and hopefully in your mind it looks a lot like that. Right? And the spring is really nice because I could do a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave. And so some of our waves are transverse and some are compressional some are longitudinal so our sound waves as we'll see are these longitudinal ones but our water waves are our transverse ones and we'll see when we get to light waves they're a transverse but all these properties that we're talking about in waves in general it still matches in fact a really fun one to put together are transverse waves when you have superpositioning and when they travel in opposite direction I mean watch this if I send the waves down and I continue to send them down and they're reflecting back 
I constantly have two waves from opposite directions. And a pattern will develop that we call standing waves because doesn't it look like it's not moving? So it kind of looks like, uh, I call them breathing waves. But the truth is, we've got one going to the left and one going to the right. And your author does a good job with his pictures on this, too. Uh, he says, right here, what would happen if you had this wave, so wave one goes to the left, and wave two goes to the right? And he says, if you add those two together right now, crest goes with crest, so you get this. Trough goes with trough, you get that. Crest goes with crest, and you get this. But a moment later, this wave, right here, wave number one, he's going to have this trough move over to this marker, right here. And he's going to have this trough move over to the next marker, right here. And he said, now if you add those two together, what do you get? And notice the trough from the first one is lining up with the crest of the second one. And so they cancel. And then over here, the crest of the first one is lining up with the trough of the second one, and so they cancel. And so what you had a moment ago was a big-looking wave, twice as big as the individual two, and then all of a sudden a flat line. And again, I, I hope that's kind of what you see here. If I do this oscillations, there is a moment in time right there <laughs> where that moment in time, all the rods are at the same level. Of course, they're in the process of changing, but they're in a flat line at that moment. And so right here, we have our destructive interference. And then, and then watch what happens a moment later. As this wave, well, I'll go to the first one, moves a little bit more, so the crest moves over to here, and this trough moves over to here, meaning this crest will be in the middle, you will now get the crests in the middle lining up, and get the result will be really big. And then, of course, the troughs will line up really big. And so we went from something that had two crests and one trough, then it became zero, now we've got two troughs and one crest, and the whole process just continues. And so the visual result is nothing's moving, and hence the name standing waves. But I want to emphasize, all this really is, is two traveling waves, one to the left, one to the right, and superpositioning of the waves. You can see it on a bigger scale. If I take this and maybe make some transverse waves, and I'll try to get three little humps in here, but hopefully this looks a lot like that picture to you, that it looks like things don't move. And did you notice there was these magical points? We call them nodes. These magical points always came out to be zero. In the picture, they would be right here where they crossed. There's a node, node, nodes, nodes, nodes. The other places seem to change, but this point Always add it up to zero. Watch, these two waves. Zero plus zero is zero. Same point. Down and up is zero. This point. Zero and zero is zero. This point. Up and down is zero. And so there's these special points, and that's why it looks like it doesn't move. These special places, again, called nodes, that you get this interference that it always comes out to be zero. And so that's this idea of our wave. Now, in the short amount of time uh, we have left here, your author goes to say then, put that thinking together with some math here. Because if you had a string or a spring, so I have a spring, but it could be a guitar string, and you pull it out to here, one end is clamped and the other end is clamped. And so, keeping in mind that if you made waves, they're going to bounce back and forth, you're going to get a standing wave pattern in here. 
But also keep in mind the endpoints have to be nodes. So what patterns could you have? And your author right here says, well, one pattern, well, let me take that little tension out. One pattern, which I'll call the boring pattern, would look like this. <laughs> In fact, I would say it's so boring, can, can you see that that's actually half a wavelength? It's not a whole wavelength. From a node to a node is only half a wavelength. You, you can hopefully see it here in the author's picture. The author's trying to say, here's a whole wavelength, but from endpoint to endpoint, node to node, that's a half wavelength. Now, he says that's not the only possibilities. And he gives this picture. He said, that, now the only condition is that the two ends be a node. So you could have a whole wavelength or you could have one and a half wavelengths. Like I said, the only condition here would be that the two endpoints are a node. So with that in mind, I could show you, and I'll start with the boring one. So here's the boring one where the whole length is equal to a half a wavelength. But if I were to change this and change the frequency, I could make the whole length equal to one wavelength. I like to call it two halves. Because another possibility is that the whole length be one and a half wavelengths. And that's what I was showing you earlier. Another possibility, and I better move on here, but I could have four humps, which would be four half wavelengths or two wavelengths. Uh, let's see, that'd be pretty fast. So, there. And this could go on and on. I would just have to make a higher and higher frequency. But the author's trying to say, and I'm trying to add to this, is that if we put that thinking I lost my black marker. But if we put that thinking into equations, we could say this. And we could have this possibility. We could have this possibility. We could have this possibility. Oh, that was a terrible drawing. But here, if this is the length, I would say L equals a half wavelength. Here, I would say L equals two half wavelengths. Here, I would say L equals three half wavelengths. If we generalize this, we could say L would equal an integer number of half wavelengths where N is one or two or three or four dot, 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 dot. Uh, here's why that becomes interesting is because if you remember that wavelength times frequency is the velocity, you can then write, and I'm going to use this word for the first time, but we're going to see it a lot next semester, you can write an equation for the different wavelengths or the different frequencies that are possible, and they are quantized. There is some integer number of them. So in other words, you can't just have any wavelength. You can have an infinite number of a certain set size. But they are quantized. This is going to come real important when we get into the atom and quantum mechanics. That there's only certain wavelengths or certain frequencies that are possible. And this will explain why we have quantization in our chemistry. Because we also have quantization of our guitar string. We call it harmonics. We say when you pluck the guitar, that G string plays the G and the harmonics. Or, not G string, E string. Uh, who plays the guitar? E, there's a, there's a, is there a G? There's not a G. There's an E. There's two E's. Anyways, but whatever the note is here, it would play that and all the harmonics. Well, watch. You'll, you'll see this here. 
in the math. That's why I say, take your thinking and let's put some math to it. What I can do is rearrange this and get 2L over N is the possible wavelengths that could exist on this string. So again, you can't get all of them. There's not any number. You can't get like seven and a half. But let's just say the length is one. Two times one is two. So you can go two divided by one. That's two. You can have two divided by two. That's one. You can have two divided by three. That's two thirds. You can have two divided by four. That's one half. So there's all these different wavelengths, but they're quantized. Oh, likewise, we can do the same thing with the frequency. The frequency would be the velocity divided by the wavelength. And we just solved for the wavelength. The wavelength is 2L over N. And if we rearrange our algebra, we get this. We get that the frequency on this guitar string would be some number times n. And so when n is equal to 1, we would say it's the fundamental frequency. So we would say that's E. We've tuned our guitar so it plays E. But also that same string when we pluck it doesn't just play an E, but it plays 2 times that frequency, which is an octave higher. We call it our first overtone. It would be three times that, four times that, five times that. And so there's a lot of different frequencies on that guitar string. However, they are all quantized. It's not just any frequency. It's multiples of the note E, whatever frequency we tune it to. And that's this whole idea. Now, one last thing about interference. And like I said, this is kind of the final piece of the interference is your author says let's look at another interference so instead of this down and back what if we have something that is traveling in the same direction but they have slightly different wavelengths one of a different size and this picture shows it well so here's wave one and here's wave two and so at the beginning, crest lines up with crest and trough lines up with trough. And so you get what we would call constructive interference. You get big crests and big troughs. But because they have a slightly different wavelength or slightly different frequency, a little bit later after they've traveled, so a little bit later in time, the crest of one lines up with the trough of the other and they begin to have destructive interference. So we started with constructive but a little later got destructive but again they would turn back to constructive a little bit later. And to illustrate that and to kind of step us into the next chapter let's demonstrate this with sound waves. Because I can make a sound wave that has one particular frequency, and that's what you hear. That's the pitch. Or I can make one which is slightly different, almost the same. In fact, unless you hear them both at the same time, you might go, it's not the same frequency. And I'm going to say, no, they are really close, but they're not the same. Let's hear them together. hear it get louder and softer? That's because they're slightly different in wavelength and when it gets louder we're here at the constructive interference. A moment later we're going to be at the destructive interference. And so we're going from constructive to destructive, constructive to destructive. We often refer to this as the beats of the wave. You probably recognize that phrase, beats, from music. But we would apply it to water waves. Once in a while, I'll hear that on the surf report. They'll say, hey, 
the beat frequency is 12 minutes meaning that every 12 minutes we will have constructive interference and so just hang out there on the surfboard and then I have constructive interference and the waves look big and I ride it in and I got about 12 minutes to get out set up get ready again before the next set of constructive interference starts before I can have the next ride and of course I want to paddle out during this time while I have destructive interference and then wait for the constructive interference and ride it and then of course paddle back out during the destructive interference and so it's kind of interesting and important to me what you know what's my timing today how, how quickly do, will the next set come it tells also about the size of the waves and the patterns and the ocean line and so we as scientists call all those interference beat in music you know you got that rhythm thump, 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 thump. and that's just the interference of all of those waves go together yeah Uh, it's the rate at which it gets loud to loud to loud and so it's how, how at what rate does it go big big and so I would do this I would call the beats the rate and how what would you say so maybe about two seconds between getting louder I'm gonna call it two seconds so I would call the beat frequency one half the period is two seconds between each one the reciprocal of that is the beat in fact I'll finish then today with this formula the beat frequency then is the difference between those two frequencies it's the rate at which it goes loud soft loud soft loud soft loud soft and hence the name frequency beat frequency and even though, like I said, you probably are more familiar with the word beat when it comes to sound waves, we can apply it equally to any waves, light waves, water waves, and sound waves. But obviously, a good set of music plays on this, and so that there's a rhythm of everybody playing the notes, and the different frequencies that are played in the band then give you that rhythm of loud soft loud soft loud soft as everybody plays together and that's kind of the the art of it all right well i guess i'll have to call it quits there we're we're, we're out of time and uh, we will move on uh i'll say bye to you guys who are online and uh you guys in in person i wanted to point out now that i think everybody is is here that uh for the last two lectures, and I'm going to do the same thing with this one, I've been adding a little supplement when I send out the email that is really me just working out examples. And so I, th I think that'll be helpful to some of you. You don't have to watch it. Uh, supplemental, that's why. I guess it's called supplemental. But it's what I run out of time, and I think it, I think it can be helpful. Uh, it's kind of like me doing the video solutions. And sometimes I've only done the video solutions, and sometimes I've done both the supplemental and the video solutions, and recently I've done both. And so I, I think I will do that again uh, this evening, even though I really need to get on your test and get that graded and get you a score but uh, hopefully I can do both tomorrow and grade all your tests and give you a score and do a solutions and send that to you and all that good stuff all right I will see you guys in lab at uh, 11 15. <laughs>